So what was the first emotion that you ever experienced since your birth? While well, telling by that primal scream that you came into this life, I would say fear. I don't know. But it won't help thinking about it because it was something, something that you experienced before you could think about it. And it wasn't a bad experience necessarily. It's the way that God created us. If our ancestors were not afraid, we wouldn't have been here. Afraid of snakes, for instance. But they also had to develop the ability to think about their emotion and to regulate in some way that emotion so that they wouldn't stay inside the cave all the time, afraid of the snakes on the outside. It's the same with us. A child hasn't developed that ability yet to think. And it's something that comes with time. Uh, after you've received your mother tongue, you can observe and describe certain experiences. You can order experiences. In that way, you can start to regulate your emotions. And you can have a better life. A very common word that's used today is emotional granulation. It has to do with our EQ, our emotional intelligence, that ability to discern and to describe clusters of emotions. Because fear can be experienced with, in a very nuanced way. You can feel overwhelmed. You can feel stressed. You can feel anxious. You can be worried. It's all part of fear. But you've got to be able to distinguish and to think about it. Otherwise, it can take away your life and take away the quality of your life. It can keep you captive. Um, so here's a big question. What do you experience at this moment? Are you afraid of something, of sickness, of growing old, of being alone, of being a burden someday perhaps to other people, your children, or of death, the future, sadness? Are you afraid of anger and and feeling afraid of what might happen, closeness, commitment, to give, to receive, being heard? Are you afraid of sex or sexuality or saying no, saying yes, being rejected, losing someone, spending money or saving money, sharing, or perhaps of losing your freedom? So this is one of the first things that we learn about the psalm that we look at today. David recognized the real danger that he's in. Verse 1. And uh, Absalom, his son, is after him. And he's coming with an army. But then he started with the granulation process, distinguishing between something real that is happening, but something that is happening inside of me. The people say, and what the people say hurts him. And now he's wondering about it. And he found a way to, to work with those feelings and those feelings of fear that he sat with. So what David did was, was to go up to the mountain, um, to a tent that they've pitched and put the ark, the holy covenant was... Um, sealed by an ark, which was the presence of God. And there he spent some time. He said he cried out to God loudly. And he asked God to help him. He opened up the scriptures and he read Genesis 15, 1, where God told Abraham 
the father of his faith and the father of our faith, do not be afraid. I'm your shield. I'm your shield. I will protect you. And I will be your reward. Something happened within David. He said, I lay down and I slept safely. I awakened for the Lord sustains me. Now, can you imagine finding a way that you can, in the midst of everything falling apart in your life, sleep and have a good night's nice rest and stand up in the morning with a confidence that God will help me to handle everything that comes my way. Roll is a very popular spiritual writer of our day, says that the other test of a true spirituality is whether you sleep at night and stay in your commitments during the day. No, not about um, knowing the Bible. You know, you're not very spiritual if you go to church or where you're tired. Or, he, he said, no, 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 no. Not whether you can do miracles or you uh, uh, can pray a lot. It's all about the effect of the way that you walk with God is measured by whether you can sleep at night and stay in your commitments during the day. Something to think about. So here's the invitation of David. The inner work that he did to handle his fear. First of all, it's an invitation for us to courage. He said, but you, O Lord, are a shield around me. Now, a shield is a, is a piece of weaponry that you use for protection if you go into battle. So first of all, he said, uh, he says that I don't run away from my troubles. God don't save me from all my troubles that I don't, I wouldn't have any battles or any problems. God doesn't take it away, but God is with me as I go into it. It reminds me of Paul. Ephesians 6, 16, that says that uh, we are in a battle with the evil one. And he said, what's very important is to take up your shield of faith. Faith is trust. Trust in God. I'm, I'm not alone in this. You know, and it doesn't mean that it's all over. Because God is with me. And he says in verse 13 that in that evil day, as if... You have a lot of evil days, but you get the evil day where everything just seems to fall apart in your life. In that day, having done all, take up your shield and just stand. You see, yes, one of the myths of fear, it's over. There's only one outcome, and it's not going to be good. You're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your life as you know it. There's no options left. So the first work is to recognize your reality. Um, not to deny it. Not to try and exercise magical thinking by saying, I just stay positive. I just believe something else. And then my circumstances will suddenly change and God will take away my fear and I don't have to be. No, I recognize it, but, but I'm not alone. And it ain't over because God is with me. The second invitation is to become vulnerable. But you, O oh Lord, are my glory. Now, what does that mean? What do we do when we Give glory to God or when we glorify God. Glory actually literally means worth, weight. So if I glorify God, I see something of great value in God. Beauty, goodness, power, what, whatever I recognize. And when I express it in words, we call it worship, with ship. Lord, this is what I see, and I'm amazed at it. So David says that 
we have glory. All of us has glory. But now he says something very interesting. But the Lord is now my glory. It's as if he's saying, I tried to find my glory in something else. My worth. My weight. And of course, that has a big bearing on your identity. You know, what, what, what I worship determines my identity and what I love. And, and what I think is, uh, it's, I'm important because I have something. And it seems as if, if that was where David got his identity. He said, I'm a bit worried. A lot of people are gossiping about me. If you read it, it wasn't all that much, but a lot of people, but it's, it's what it felt like to him. Everybody's talking to me and it's not good. Um, we can find our glory in what people say of us, in what we are able to do, what we achieve, or what we have. That's where we find our ultimate security and our comfort, uh, our position, possessions, and power. And of course, in this life, we will be challenged. If that becomes the ultimate in your life, because that is actually what an idol is. It's something that God created or somebody that just becomes of greater value to you than God. It's more important to me than God. It becomes an end and not a means to an end. It's not something that I realize and look at as a gift from God that I can enjoy. I hold on lightly to it because I can lose it, but I won't lose God. And that's what David discovered. So early in life, we can experience losses that will challenge us with what we hold on to, challenge us as with what we, where we get our glory and what we glorify in life. David was 60 years old now, written all the Psalms, and um, it is something that happens to you at that age. You just lose a lot more. You know, you, your looks, your wholeness, uh, people around you, your life just seems to get smaller and smaller, and you realize eventually I'm going to lose everything. And it, it can take you to a place of fear. And David discovered, no, even if I lose my position as the king, I lose the comfort, I lose the palace, and I lose the esteem of all the people, I don't lose God. And here's another big myth of fear. Fear will tell you, you're going to lose everything. And when you lose that stuff, your life is over. You will be nothing and you won't have a life anymore. And it's a myth. The truth is, God will always be there. And he can be my ultimate glory. The next invitation is to action. But you, O oh Lord, are the one who holds my head high. So what does it mean to keep your head up high? It means not to live in shame, not to look down, not to be able to look anybody in the eye. You know, and that's what happened to David. Coming down the mountain, just after his prayer, somebody by the name of Simei came out shouting and saying, um, David, you've sinned. And it's going to be the end of you. It's like Saul. God took away the kingship from Saul because he sinned. And you know your sin. You know where your relationship with Bathsheba started. Uh, it wasn't in love. It was in lust. And, and you know what you did to a husband. Uh, you know your sins. You know, and there's a lot of things that David can't be proud of. You know, he was an excellent singer and a a, a writer, and he was, a, he was a good worshiper, and he loved God. He was a very good king, and he, he, he was a good soldier, but he wasn't a good father. His own son wants to take the throne from him now. And David knows that there's a lot of stuff that I should be ashamed of. 
And this Simei just touches on that nerve in his life. One of the generals with him said, let me kill this man. How can he talk to you like that? You're the king. And David says, no, there, there's some truth in what he says as well. And who knows, you know? And, um, and, and David has to work with that feelings of shame, of, of not being able to, to, to look anybody in the eye, to be paralyzed just to hide away forever from everything and everybody. But he found a way. He says, with God, with God, I can look up. It doesn't matter. I know I'm not perfect. I've got a lot of challenges in life, but, but I'm loved. I'm hold. God's with me and God will never leave me. I've got something else to hold on to. It softens his heart, you know. He, he prays for the people. He tells the people, um, leave the city. He's not paralyzed. You know, and that's one of the other big things about fear. Fear will paralyze you. The myth is you can't do anything. It won't help to even try. David says, no, I pick up my head. I, I, I think I do it for other people as well. I stand up for their sake. And it's as if this love-motivated action just drove out all the fear in his heart. So we, we, we think that sometimes that God must miraculously come and just take away these feelings of fear. Or we should not fear means that we should deny the feelings of fear that we have. No, it's a process. I acknowledge it. And there's something good in this experience of fear. It's a good messenger telling me that your life's in danger. Look after yourself. But then I've got to discern. There's this anxiety. There's this hanging. There's this feeling that everything's going to go for worse. And, and, and courage means that in spite of those feelings... I will act against it. I will stand up. I will do something. I will look people in the eye. And when you do that, you discover your fear resides. You discover that God frees you from the fear inside of you. And you know what happened to um, Absalom? He, he eventually died hanging in the trees, turpentine trees. God delivered him in a miraculous way. I don't know where you are today. We've been on this journey of dealing with the losses that we went through, grief, and perhaps the cluster of grief, sadness, anger, fear, how do we grieve? How do we deal with it? And, and we're invited through the Psalms in a way to do it with God and with each other. It's a journey that we do and we go on to recognize, to think about it, to allow these feelings, but to let them go through us by voicing it. And by sharing it with God and with other people that we love and that's around us. And to go through this journey with God. And this week, you perhaps invited to write a psalm. A but psalm. Like David. You know, there's all this stuff happening in my life. This is the real stuff. This is the stuff that you can see. This is the stuff that you can't see that's happening inside of me. This is the story I'm telling myself. And, and this is the stuff that I've got to discern about. But then there's always the but. But you know what? God is my shield. God is my glory. And he's the lifter of my head. Write your butt. It's like the, the last part in the prayer that Jesus taught us. That our Father which art in heaven, thou art the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever and ever. Yes, this is the reality of my life. And I don't deny it. But this is the truth 
This is the truth on which I stand. God is with me. Write your psalm of but to God and perhaps share it to some, somebody close to you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can do life deeply with you and with each other. Thank you. Thank you for courage to face the reality. Thank you for vulnerability to go to the deep places inside of us and to become honest about what we really value and what the most important things are in our life. And I thank you that you help us to change it, to recognize it, to confess it. But not only our sins, but to confess our faith. Thank you, Lord, that we can experience that as we do, as we start to take those first steps in faith, how you just open up the waters for us, how you just miraculously provide and how things can change. We thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.